My name is, is Mark Cronin. I'm the, the coordinator of this project and um, we're now coming to the end of it. We've been part of this project. We started in January 2011 and the project ends at the end of this year. So this is a very appropriate time to bring together the, the main findings and outputs from the project. And to put it into context, this is a slide that's very commonly used. The cosmetics industry is very important. Um, whether we like it or not, it employs an enormous number of people directly and indirectly within the European Union. It's recognized as such. Nearly all, if not all, European Union members will use vast numbers of cosmetic type products and it has a enormous financial impact on us all. I meant to take that last bullet point. Whether it's a good thing or a bad thing that the average European spends as much on cosmetics as, um, as they do on bread. The bakers probably are upset as are the, the cosmetics industry. We have a series of uh, products that we use and, and we need to ensure their safety. And it's important to note that the cosmetics are a vanity product. They're not an essential product, but I'm sure many of the colleagues in the room would agree, particularly those who just walked in, um, that they're essential. They create a, a sense of well-being. Um, and in some, some points uh, are necessary for, for existence. As you're almost certainly aware, the European Union Cosmetics Regulation has banned since 2013 testing on ingredients or marketing of products with uh, ingredients tested after that. And within the, the US, uh, colleagues from the US FDA have other regulations for colors uh, and food substances. So within this context that we've got A, a financially vital commodity and product, and B, one that is for human health and well-being um, also important. We're in a context of how to ensure safety of new products um, without uh, testing or using the, the traditional method. As I say, the traditional method to assess particularly long-term repeat dose toxicity was to take animals used in vivo repeat dose toxicity testing aiming to derive a concentration following testing at one or more doses that would cause no effect. So we're trying to identify a safe, if I can call it that, a safe level in animals, which could then be, uh, with some safety factors, extrapolated up to a safe factor in um, products. This, of course, now is banned, the use of animal tests. So the question becomes, how do we um, replace those and the alternatives to in vivo animal testing, I've basically summed them up in two ways there. The so-called biological alternatives, the use of in vitro assays and molecular biology, and the computational type assays, which we'll be addressing much more today. It's important to note, um, whilst this is nine or ten years old, like four or five years old now, um, this area was reviewed, and I think the realization is and this was an expert review that was commissioned by what was then DG Sanko, so the Commission Directorate General for Business, responsible for cosmetics. And this particular review brought together about 50 experts, global experts in the areas of toxicology to review the status of alternatives. And it was actually quite damning on the status of alternatives. So it reviews them by endpoint. So it says for systemic toxicological endpoints of repeated dose toxicity, carcinogenicity and re reproductive toxicity, the time horizon for full replacement could not be estimated. So what this said was five years ago that there was no prospect of a replacement for the in vivo animal test that would give you the same information. And the question of course is are we any closer? Well. Um, I think if we were to perform the same exercise now, you may disagree with me, we would probably make the same conclusion. So in that context, and also in the, the context of what's going on with the, the NAS report in 21st century toxicology, we're seeing a paradigm shift, a paradigm change in how we're thinking about doing modern risk assessment. Toxicology in the 21st century is a movement aiming to improve toxicity testing making the test more relevant, faster, cheaper, and ethical. 
And we've also seen an explosion, if you want, of the, the concepts of the use of mechanistic basis within um, toxicity assessment. And within the last since um, this project started, the so-called adverse outcome pathway. And as I've said several times, when we prepared the project proposal for this project, the words adverse outcome pathway were not written into it. And that, since that time, they seem to be an established, almost historical part of, of modern toxicology. So we're in this context that toxicology is changing and we need new methods. As a response to this, at least in part, the European Commission, in partnership with formerly CLEPA, renamed Cosmetics Europe, put forward a 50 million euro funding um, stream, a cluster of projects, seven projects, so five science-based projects, a data warehousing and a coordination action, uh, to try and address this specific problem. So these projects are running concurrently. They're all due to finish at the end of this year. This will be a major effort. And this is referred to as SURAT-1. Within SURAT-1, within this 50 million funding stream, um, what we're talking about today is one single of those projects, the COSMOS project, which is the single project that's really focused on in silico and computational approaches. I should also say that this is one, if not the first, initiative, particularly in this area, where the Commission effectively had public-private finance initiatives. So part of the funding, well, in this case 50% of the funding, came from Cosmetics Europe, the trade association to the larger cosmetics industries. So we've had a large input from um, the cosmetics industries as well. Cosmos Project is what we're talking about today. We're talking about integrated in silico models, so computational models that are trying to tell us something about the toxicity of chemicals, particularly with regard to humans. Uh, we have 15 partners within the COSMOS project. If you're familiar with the European Union project setup, um, this will be no surprise to you. What is slightly different here is that the Two of the partners are in the U.S. Um, in this funding stream, U.S. partners could be funded. And one of those partners is the, the U.S. FDA, the um, office responsible for, for food and color additives. It's a truly international project. Um, our funding budget was 6.7 million euros. And as I said, we're just coming to the end of that at the moment. Cosmos Project, where well, you think of a name, if you um, ever involved in European Union projects, they only succeed if you have a good name. So I can't remember, it wasn't me, who I think it was actually Johnny who came up originally with, with Cosmos as a name. And various of my colleagues in the room have taken it upon themselves to trawl around the back streets of um, European cities, mainly to find dodgy bars called Cosmos and email me pictures of them. So Cosmos does have a certain identity, not all of it. Uh, very wholesome, but we're talking about the Cosmos project at this time. And what we're trying to do is understand the link between, in this case, chemical structure. So why would, okay, this is paracetamol, but why would this compound cause liver toxicity? Now this is one of the best, most studied liver toxicants, and we know why. We may not know the exact mechanism, and there's still a lot of research into that, but we know the majority of the causes. If we know that, can we apply that knowledge to other molecules? And also, can we say, if you get a, a molecule that may have this capacity to, to cause toxicity, is it going to be safe in a product? I can take a reasonable amount of paracetamol every day in some certainty that it won't cause toxicity. So it's not just identifying the hazard, but it's also identifying um, the exposure, and the kinetics of exposure. And these are some of the aspects that we've been dealing with within COSMOS, and also the whole SURA uh, consortium has been uh, addressing these. To set the scene for today, we very much feel that to address toxicity prediction, as we thought about it maybe 10 years ago, we need to separate out the identification of hazards and the identification of bioavailability. And within COSMOS, we've been trying to 
make predictions of effect. So we might use some of the methods you'll hear about today to say whether a hazard is associated with the compound. So we know paracetamol has a hazard associated with it. But also a prediction of ADME and an understanding of whether your exposure to the compound will um, retrieve a, a concentration that may cause a toxic effect. And added into this elements of exposure, so we're going to talk about this afternoon, TTC, the relative concentrations. Within COSMOS, we've been trying to develop in silico and computational approaches to address these issues here. So predict toxicity, predict ADME properties, and come up with some more reasonable assessment, particularly for cosmetics ingredients of exposure. So the Cosmos project is divided into various work packages. Um, and what you're going to hear about today, we're going to start off thinking about some of the in silico models, toxicity prediction and also ADME. We'll talk about some of the PBBK and in vitro and vivo extrapolation models. Later this afternoon, we'll talk about a big data compilation and sharing initiative, um, the Cosmos DB, and we're going to illustrate to you how this is going to continue on in the future. And we're also going to introduce a lot of work that's been undertaken in the, the threshold of toxicological concern, tell you what that is and how the COSMOS project has enriched a database, uh, particularly for cosmetics ingredients. And also, um, at some point this morning, I think, you're going to be able to see at least some of the tools some of the NIME technology, so work computational technology, that will enable you to use these types of models.